The Sable Point Lightkeepers Association estimates that there are nearly 1,500 shipwrecks on Lake Michigan. One of those is the three-masted schooner, Rouse Simmons. November 23, 1912, the schooner passed the Kiwani Life-Saving Station, flying a flag of distress, disappeared into the fog and snow, and was never seen again. The loss of the ship that was known affectionately throughout Chicago as the Christmas Tree Ship is symbolic of the risk taken by the vessels and sailors who braved the storm-ridden Great Lakes. The schooner Rouse Simmons was built in Milwaukee in 1868 by Allen McClelland and Company. She was built at the zenith of Great Lakes trade with more than 1,800 vessels sailing. She was named for Rouse Simmons the businessman, a prominent Kenosha politician and businessman who helped arrange financing for the ship. Schooners had become popular cargo ships, especially in coastal waters in the Great Lakes after 1800. They required fewer crew than square-rigged ships and were generally used in the U.S. to carry bulk cargo like coal and timber. The timber trade exploded on the lakes, carrying wood from Wisconsin, Michigan, Canada, and the Upper Peninsula south to ports in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Ontario. The trade began in earnest around 1830. One of the largest markets for northern timber was the growing city of Chicago. Chicago was organized in 1833 with a population of about 200 people, but grew quickly. By 1840, it had a population of 6,000 and was one of the fastest-growing cities in the world for several decades following. The city grew to 1 million people by 1890. The first lumber mill in Chicago was built in 1833, and soon timber began to be delivered in earnest. Huge lumber yards grew in Chicago, which became a central piece of the lumber trade. A canal opened in 1848, which allowed trade from the Great Lakes to reach the Mississippi River, and Chicago became a hub of trade between the eastern and western states. The lumber trade was especially vital to the city after the Great Fire in 1871, and in the year following, more ships entered the port of Chicago than in New York, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Charleston combined. The Simmons first sailed out of Milwaukee, was owned by Royal B. Towsley. In a few years, the Simmons was purchased by Charles H. Hackley, a lumber magnate from Muskegon, Michigan, and joined a large fleet that delivered lumber from mills to ports around the lake. She served as part of Hackley's fleet for 20 years, and records from the U.S. Customs Service show that in 1883, Simmons was making almost weekly runs from Grand Haven, Michigan to Chicago, likely carrying lumber. Three years before the Simmons was built, Herman Schooneman was born in the town of Onopee, now Algoma, Wisconsin. He was one of six children, and his eldest brother, August, was born in 1853. August was the first to make his living on sailing ships on the lake, but Herman soon followed. And by the 1890s, both lived in Chicago. Schooneman and his brother were especially known for Christmas tree runs, among the last sailing runs of the year before ice and weather make the lakes impassable. The Schoonemans were part of a large German immigration that peaked in the 1800s. In 1882, 250,000 German immigrants arrived in the United States, part of nearly 1.5 million who immigrated over the decade. The millions of German immigrants brought with them German culture and played a significant part in popularizing the Christmas tree in the United States. Many of these Germans moved to the Midwest, where in 1850 they made up one-sixth of Chicago's population. The lack of plentiful evergreen trees near Chicago made the late-year Christmas tree shipments lucrative, especially for men like Schooneman, who sold these trees directly to consumers instead of to middlemen in the city. Schooneman commanded numerous schooners in his career, including George Rand, the Bertha Barnes, and the Mary Collins. The number of Christmas tree ships is uncertain and fluctuated year by year, but the National Archives estimates that perhaps two dozen ships made the late-season delivery in an average year. August started in the trade first, starting in the mid-1870s, and Herman followed beginning around 1887. According to an 1897 article in the Chicago Sunday Chronicle, it was August Schooneman who first brought Christmas trees across the lake to Chicago in 1876. Living in Chicago, Herman Schooneman married Barbara Schindel, a German immigrant, on April 9, 1891. They had three daughters, Elsie, born in 1892, and twins Hazel and Pearl in 1898. Anyone relying on shipping in the lakes knew that they would spend the winter unable to sail, and Herman subsidized his shipping by starting businesses in Chicago. In 1906, he owned a saloon, but he petitioned for bankruptcy in January 1907 with $1,300 in debt that he couldn't pay. At Christmas time, the Schoonemans would sail ships into Chicago, where they would dock their ships in the Chicago River, where they sold trees, garland, and wreaths on the deck of their ship. 
hired women, a newspaper reported scores of women, would decorate the ship with garland and bring electric lights. A report from the Chicago Inter-Ocean in 1899 described Schunemann's operation. With 50 young girls weaving wreaths and garlands by hand, when they have completed their task, an emerald cable long enough to reach from Chicago to New York will have been braided by their deft fingers. The paper reported that he had been in business for seven years past. In 1899, he brought 12,000 trees, including a 34-foot-tall tree, which was perfectly pear-shaped. He sold the tree for between 50 cents and a dollar. A reporter who knew the captain personally remembered the Christmas season didn't really arrive until the Christmas tree ship tied up at Clark Street. In 1898, Herman's brother August purchased the ship S. Tal, a two-masted schooner, for $650, which had just been sold at auction by U.S. Marshals. The former owner had failed to pay his ship cook $66, and the ship was ordered sold in court to satisfy the debt. August was sailing ship back to Chicago in November when it was caught in a particularly rough storm. The ship was sighted off Glencoe, Illinois, struggling against large waves and wind. The Thal eventually dropped anchor in an attempt to weather the storm, but the storm only grew worse, with wind speeds reaching 60 miles per hour. A witness reported that the Thal tried to get underway, only for the wind to tear the foresail to shreds and toss the vessel as it were a mere log. The ship disappeared into the fog. It seems to have been smashed to pieces on a sandbar. There were no survivors. August died just a month after the birth of Herman's twins. Sailing on the lakes, especially in the late fall, was an extraordinarily dangerous business. But the tragedy didn't stop Herman from continuing in the trade. He made a run the same year that August died, bringing in 11,000 trees. Each year he parked his ship at the southwest corner of Clark Street Bridge and dubbed his business the Northern Michigan Evergreen Nursery. Schooneman sold thousands of trees each year. In 1909, he reported that he only sold 15,000 trees, a paltry number, he thought, as the Chicago market depends pretty much on my supply. Herman's wife and daughters helped hawk the trees and other Christmas decorations in November and December each year. Herman became especially well-known thanks to his penchant for giving trees to the poorest of Chicagoans free of charge. The newspaper dubbed him Captain Santa, a title he treasured. He kept newspaper clippings with the title in his oilskin wallet. Herman was not immune from the dangers of the lakes either. In 1898, he lost the Mary Collins when it ran aground, though all the crew survived. In 1908, while captaining the George Wren, he had nearly gone down with a ship in a storm, apparently with 50 women on board weaving wreaths. Last year, she nearly chucked the captain and his crew into Davy Jones' locker, he said. The ship survived the trip, but he replaced it with the Bertha Barnes in 1909, and in 1910 bought a share of ownership in the Rouse Simmons. When he bought it, the Simmons was almost as old as he was and had been sailing the lakes for more than 40 years. Like the S. Tall, the strategy of many of the Christmas tree ship captains was to buy older ships that still had a few years of service in them, though they of course risked more in the aged boats. By 1912, Schooneman owned a one-eighth share of the Simmons. A second captain, Charles Nelson, owned another one-eighth share, while Mans Bonner, a businessman from St. James, Michigan, owned a three-quarter interest. These were the twilight years of Christmas tree ships, and indeed, sailing ships on Lake Michigan. Within a decade, schooners and masts would disappear, replaced by steamships and shipping by train. Schooneman, Nelson, and around 15 crew, including tree cutters, sailed for the Upper Peninsula in November to harvest trees from land Schooneman owned. The journey back to Chicago from near Thompson, Michigan, where he had harvested their trees, took about a week. On Friday, November 22nd, Schooneman prepared his ship to sail, loaded with an estimated 5,000 trees. Reports would later claim that Schooneman was warned by friends that the barometer was low and falling, evidence that a heavy storm was on its way. The Chicago American interviewed a man named Hogan Hoganson, supposedly one of Schooneman's crew, who claimed that he had left because the ship was overloaded and lacked lifeboats, and that even the rats had deserted it. Another crewman called Big Bill Sullivan later said that he had a hunch and went back to Chicago on the train. Professor Theodore Karamansky, author of the book Schooner Passage, noted that the short hauls and buoyant cargoes of the lumber trade encouraged captains to overload their vessels, and Christmas trees were believed to be especially buoyant. Nevertheless, Rouse Simmons left the Upper Peninsula bound for Chicago that afternoon. The National Weather Service forecast only local rains or snow Saturday and variable winds from the northwest. But the storm proved worse than that. Weather grew worse throughout Friday and into the evening, with heavy rain turned to snow. 
Schooneman was a veteran captain who had been sailing in the late fall on the lakes for decades. But in 1912, his luck finally turned. Reports of the storm would call it one of the worst on Lake Michigan in three years, and that heavy winds raised huge waves. Winds reached 60 miles an hour along the lakeshore. There was sudden nasty weather. The Sheboygan Press reported about the most sudden that I can remember. The Rouse Simmons was sighted in the afternoon on Saturday, November 23rd, around 2.50 p.m., by the Kiwani Life Saving Station. Its flag was flying at half-mast to indicate distress. But Kiwani had no tugboat available, and the Simmons was continuing down the coast. At 3.10, the station keeper called the Two Rivers Station, just to the south, and the powerboat Tuscaora was sent to meet the ship. But the Simmons was never seen again. What happened in the final hours isn't known. Sometime after she was sighted at 2.50 p.m., the Simmons went down. There were no survivors, and the only reports are two messages in bottles found after the wreck, neither of which are certainly from the Simmons. The first was reported in 1913 and read, These lines were written at 10.30 p.m. Schooner Rouse Simmons ready to go down about 20 miles southeast of Twin River Point, between 15 and 20 miles offshore. All hands lushed to one line. Goodbye. It was signed, Captain Charles Nelson. The second read Friday, everybody goodbye, I guess we are all through. During the night, the small boat washed overboard, leaking bad. Invald and Steve lost two. God help us. This one was supposedly written by Schooneman. Modern examinations prove that the Tuscora was within sight of the location where Simmons went down by 4.20, but the snow of the storm started in earnest around 5 p.m. Christmas trees began to wash up on shore, though many more were trapped with the ship as it sank. The trees on deck may have been thrown over deliberately to lighten the ship's load or washed off. All hands lashed to one line makes sense if the other note is genuine and there have been crew members washed off the deck. The remaining crew would tie themselves together with rope and finally to the mast to prevent from being washed away. Though legend has made it seem that the ship was lost in a heavy storm, the weather on the afternoon of the 23rd was still clear, although the lake was rough. The ship's resting place wasn't found until 1971. A modern archaeological examination showed that the crew had attempted to drop their anchor. But they were too deep to safely anchor, but may have dropped the anchor to hold the ship into the wind. There is evidence that the deck fasteners may have failed. The overloaded ship, running low in rough water, sank fast. The ship had hit the lake bottom hard, throwing the rigging forward, dislodging two of her three masts and snapping the last. In 1924, a final message from the wreck was found when Captain Schooneman's oilskin wallet was fished out of the lake, remarkably intact. It took days for the family in Chicago to start worrying, but reports in the first week of December slowly came into focus, making it clear that the Rouse Simmons was not going to limp home. Friends of the family offered a ship, and Schooneman's wife and daughter sold trees that year from it. Trees recovered from the wreck were sold to benefit the families and the lost crew. The Schooneman family was in dire straits that Christmas. Nearly all of their money had been invested in the Simmons cargo. Despite everything, Barbara Schooneman and her daughter Elsie continued to sail the lakes and bring Christmas trees to Chicago, though they eventually bought in the trees by train. The captain's three daughters continued to sell trees even several years after Barbara died, in the 1930s. The story of the Rouse Simmons and the Schoonemans covers much of the era of the schooner on the Great Lakes. Simmons was built during the heyday, but by the time that she sunk, she was one of only a few still plying the Great Lakes, and by 1920, there were almost none left. The Christmas tree ships, like the Schoonemans, had a deep cultural impact on Chicago, and for decades later, people remembered the days when Captain Santa brought his trees. The ship's wheel and one of the Christmas trees have been preserved, and the ship's anchor now sits at the entrance to the Milwaukee Yacht Club. Songs, plays, and other things have been written to commemorate the ship and her generous captain. Since 2000, the United States Coast Guard does a reenactment, bringing trees to Chicago for needy families. The Schoonemans would be happy to know that the tradition has been kept alive. November of 1913, a year after the loss of the Rouse Simmons, the Chicago Daily News published an interview with Barbara when she said, We'll load up the trees and tie it up at the old dock. The Rouse is gone, and her captain is gone, and her crew is gone, but Christmas will find the survivors still on the dock, and Chicago will have her Christmas trees as long as the Schoonemans last. 
I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 